So this was the question that I ended the previous part of the lecture with, and hopefully you looked at A and thought about what I'd just been saying about how proven reserves are continuing to grow and concluded that it's not likely to be A. And frankly, I put C there just to give you a laugh. The answer is almost certainly B, though to really know, you would probably have to go and read that BP source and see what they actually give as their justifications. A useful general concept that we're going to need is energy density. I'm introducing this concept in this lecture on fossil fuels, but in fact we'll use this with virtually every type of energy we look at. The basic idea of energy density is that it is just the energy stored per unit volume in, say, a material system or region. Energy divided by volume. There's a closely related concept called specific energy, which is the energy stored per unit mass, energy by mass. But be very careful, often this is also called energy density. And of course, now we have two things going by the same name which have different meanings, which of course is likely to cause confusion. So to avoid confusion, do what you should always be doing anyway and always show your units. This definition, as stated, is rather vague. Energy stored per unit volume. Stored how? What types of energy? In principle, we could mean all types of energy that are stored in an object or material, but usually that's not what we mean. We're usually interested in some particular types of energy which are relevant to the situation we're thinking about. So, for example, let's think about a cubic meter of gasoline. That cubic meter of gasoline certainly has some amount of energy. But suppose we take that cubic meter of gasoline and put it in a truck that is moving down the highway at some high speed. Well, now it definitely has more energy because it has kinetic energy. But that's probably not relevant. If we're talking about the energy density of gasoline, what we're probably thinking about is its value as a fuel, and the kinetic energy it has is totally irrelevant to that. So the stored energy we would be interested in is chemical energy. More specifically, it would be the amount of chemical energy that gets converted to thermal energy when we burn the gasoline in air at a constant pressure. Technically, that's really enthalpy density, but it's usually what would be meant when talking about the energy density of gasoline. In contrast, let's think of a different example. Suppose instead we're talking about a spinning flywheel. Various devices use flywheels to store energy. And the flywheel has kinetic energy. It's the motion of the flywheel that is used to store the energy. Now, admittedly, the flywheel, if unmaintained, will eventually oxidize, reacting with the air, and so it could be said to have some chemical energy. But again, that's irrelevant if what we're thinking about is the quality of the flywheel as an energy storage device, and so it would be the kinetic energy density that we would be interested in. So, while the general definition of energy density is that it is all of the energy per unit volume in a material system or region of space, for most practical purposes, what we actually mean is some specific type of energy available for transformation under some particular process that we might think of as the normal use. So let's now turn our attention to energy densities of fossil fuels, remembering that this is energy per unit volume obtained from burning them. And I'm giving them in gigajoules per meter cubed, but note that there are a thousand megajoules in a gigajoule and a thousand liters in a cubic meter, and so all these numbers would be the same in megajoules per liter in cases where that's more convenient. Here are the numbers, and the numbers themselves aren't that important. I mostly want to talk a little bit about where they come from and what they mean. The first thing to note is that these are all highly variable. Crude oil coming from, say, Venezuela is rather different from crude oil coming from, say, Texas, and so we wouldn't expect them to have the same energy density. So I've got this figure by taking an IRS definition of a barrel of oil equivalent, which I'm taking as fairly typical, 
and a definition of the size of a barrel. So from those numbers, I would encourage you to verify that you get the same energy density that I did. This figure I'm giving for coal is for a specific type of coal, anthracite. What about lignite, bituminous coal? And what's actually burned in power plants is often refined forms of these. So all of these vary quite a bit. Even gasoline, which is a refined product, doesn't vary as much, but still does vary from producer to producer. It's important to note that the energy density of natural gas is much, much lower than these others, but the reason for that is simple to understand. It is a gas and has a low mass density. If we instead look at the specific energy, energy per unit mass, then we find that natural gas is comparable and in fact higher than the others. So let's check that you understand energy density and specific energy. So for solids, it's generally easier to measure masses than volumes, and so often if you look things like this up for coal, you're going to find specific energies tabulated, but possibly not energy densities. And sometimes what you actually want is an energy density. So let's convert. For lignite, we have this value for specific energy, and we have its mass density. So use those to find a typical energy density for lignite.